Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 66 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the works of writer, director, producer J.J. Abrams and his extended bad robot universe. I am your co host, Matt Crandall, here with Marcelo Inestroza as we are wrapping up, putting a bow on Lost season five. Today, we are talking about the season finale, The Incident, which is broken into two parts for streaming The Incident, part one and part two. We're just going to talk about the whole thing as one big episode as it originally aired on May 13th, 2009. Marcelo, have you found the loophole you've been looking for? Oh my heavenly God, Matt. When I saw this episode earlier today, and it starts off with a guy spinning yarn in this cave, and then it cuts to him making fish on a beach. And it turns out that... The beach that he's on is our island. All of a sudden, this guy in black walks up to him and he says, Good morning, Jacob. And then the guy in black says, Good morning. I'm sitting there thinking, Who the fuck is this guy? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, Holy shit. The thing that I really loved about this episode is that you see Jacob visiting several of our losties when they were really, really young. And I just loved that little quirk of this episode. No, I love that quirk of the episode too. And so it does open with Jacob, who we are seeing for the first time played by Mark Pellegrino, who is a great character actor, but he also in this same year, uh, had a major recurring role that would go on until the show ended on supernatural playing Lucifer, (laughs) playing the devil And then here he shows up as basically the exact opposite of the devil. And we see him and the man in black played by another great Titan, Titus Welliver, who also was on Supernatural as one of the four horsemen that same season, which aired the same year as this season of Lost. Uh, So those guys have done stuff. But it was funny because the man in black clearly seems because they put him in black and Jacob is wearing, you know, bright colors. They have this talk where we see Jacob using this loom and weaving a tapestry, going about his business, cooking a fish, and Man in Black comes up and they have a talk where they see the black rock off in the distance on the edge of the island. And the the two who seem like God and the devil or something like that. We know from this scenario, it feels like or Cain and Abel. Like these guys have a close knit relationship. One of them is good. One of them is bad. They are talking about humanity in these grand terms as if there is some sort of bet going on about whether humans are any good or not. And as the scene goes on, they reveal that the man in black, his only desire is to kill this other guy that he's on the beach with because he can't stand him. But it's against the rules and he is not allowed. But one day he will find a loophole to let him kill this guy that he is cosmically tied to and stuck with. And I loved that moment where it's like, whoa, who is this? And then the man in black to end the scene says, always nights talking to you, Jacob. And we know for sure that this is now Jacob and this mysterious man in black. And then we zoom out and we see that they are basically sitting at the feet of the giant statue. And that scene added so much to the mythos of lost, making us wonder everything about Jacob and this mysterious man in black, why they can't hurt each other, why you would need to find a loophole. And the way they are talking about the goodness of men really feels broad and big and cosmic in like a super forgive supernatural religious sort of sense. And then we do see that Jacob has visited many of our losties throughout the episode at various points in their life, which was really cool to see a young Sawyer, a young Kate Hurley, just before he got on the plane, all of these visits made the flashbacks during this episode 
absolutely fascinating because we are revisiting our favorite characters during key moments of their life. And at all of these key moments, this guy, this fucking guy shows up. The moment when Locke gets chucked out the window, Jacob was there. The moment after Jack has this huge incident, Jacob was there. So seeing that this guy is at all these pivotal moments adds so many more questions about who, what, like we, we've heard the name Jacob this season. It's been more important than ever, but to now actually meet him and see that he has all these connections. Marcella, what was your favorite connection to the past that Jacob had during this episode? And what are you thinking in terms of who and what Jacob is as we're seeing all this interaction from the past that we didn't know that he he crossed paths with so many of our losties during his life i was thinking during the episode as he was revisiting our losties during several points of their lives i was thinking does he really think that visiting these people as children will possibly influence them to become the people that eventually end up on the plane the other thing that i was thinking is that if this guy is supposedly God, when he visited Saeed and Nadia, why did why in the hell didn't he save Nadia from dying? So if this guy is a good guy, why didn't he save Nadia? He, he could have possibly thought of another way to sort of separate Saeed from Nadia further, further down the road. But if he's such a good guy... Why did he do what he did? So that got me thinking, he's only a good guy if it serves him. If it doesn't serve him, he's willing to make the questionable choice. That is a really good point. And I wondered, because the way that it's filmed, it does feel like, you know, he distracts Saeed while Nadia is crossing the street and he's the reason that she stops. But then I, I start to wonder were they both going to get hit by a car and they were both going to die and that was fated to happen, but Jacob intervened to save Saeed. So that's the only thing that I start wondering, especially because we see that flashback and then shortly after that, we see him visit Ilana in the hospital and he gives her this mission that we know that she's been on some sort of quest asking, you know, what's the shadow of the statue or whatever it is. So we know there's more going on with her. And the fact that we see him visit her right after it starts to make me wonder. So that Saeed thing definitely throws in a wrench where you wonder, is this a selfish guy who only does what is right for him? Or did he save Saeed and actually him intervening was his way of trying to help? So I don't know. It, it raises so many questions. The other scene that I particularly loved is a scene where Locke and Ben are sitting on the beach. Just a little bit before that scene, Locke tells Ben that, you know, he needs to do something for him. And in the particular scene, Ben sort of admits that he is not a perfect individual, that he is a fallible individual. And I particularly loved the acting by Michael Emerson. It is, it is so refreshing and it is so uh, unusual to see Benjamin Linus be played in such a uh, wide open manner by Michael Emerson. This scene did not make me feel any pity for the kind of character that Michael Emerson is. You know, we get that scene with, you know, Locke, Benjamin and Jacob in in the temple. You know, Ben says to Jacob, listen, I've been here for 35 years. I've done everything that you've asked me to. Why haven't you accepted me? What about me? You know, Jacob says one of the most famous lines in Lost, in my opinion, what about you? I was just blown away by Michael Lemison's performance in, in, in this specific episode. He was amazing. And I think... Part of it is that we, we've we spent so much time with Benjamin Linus that even earlier in the episode, as they are walking to get to Jacob, Locke and Ben have a talk where 
Ben says, like, aren't you going to tell them why we're actually going to find Jacob? And Locke goes, no, they don't need to know. But also, FYI, I'm not going to be the guy who does it. You are. And Ben is like, what makes you think that I would kill Jacob? And Locke starts putting into his head, saying, don't you remember that this guy has wronged you? Everything that is wrong with your life has been in the name of Jacob, a guy you have never even met. Like, remember, you've never met him. He's never revealed himself to you. And so I love that Locke plants all of these seeds on that walk. And he even says to him, you know, the real question is, why wouldn't you want to kill him? And then when we do get to the temple, to the the place behind the statue, which is what lies in the shadow of the statue, it is where Jacob lives. And I love that that moment where Ben starts to try and make it all about him, because that is how he thinks. That is why he's been so mad about John Locke coming in and being hot shit, because he feels like it diminishes his role as this important, integral piece of the others. And so, like you said, that is such a great line where he says, what about me? And Jacob's only reply is, what about you? As if, like, this is not even worth addressing. So Emerson has earned it because they have established this pettiness and this child throwing a tantrum needing to be important aspect of Ben's character throughout. And the fact that on that walk, Locke is prodding him and laying the groundwork so that no matter what Jacob says in those moments, it's not going to change Ben's mind. But the fact that Jacob also does not go out of his way to plead to Ben's better nature, to appease him, also is one of those moments where we're like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that to him. Because we know that if you treat Ben like that, you are going to get got. And... It's it's horrifying to see and shocking. Of course, the thing that we know moments before this, the big reveal of the episode, again, another season finale reveal that is John Locke in a coffin. The whole episode, Ilana and her crew have been marching around. They burned down Jacob's cabin and they've been carrying a giant box. And at one point they open it and they show Lapidus what's in the box. And he's like, oh, fuck. And we don't see it. But finally, towards the end, when they arrive at the beach and she says, I need to talk to Ricardus. And he said, it's actually Richard. And she says, what lives in the shadow of the statue? He replies the whatever it is he says. And she opens the the big thing they've been carrying around this whole episode and they dump it out unceremoniously without trying to like, you know, be gingerly about it. They just dump out the body and it's John Locke's dead body. So John Locke is still dead. And they say, if that's Locke, then who is in there? And so right before that Ben and Jacob stuff goes down, we now know this is not John Locke. This is something else. The dialogue in that scene with Jacob reveals to us because Locke says he's looking at him and Jacob says, I guess you found your loophole. So then we know that this is the man in black. We still don't know who the man in black is or what's going on or how he could make himself look like John Locke, but Locke is still dead. His body did not come back from the dead. As they have said earlier, dead is dead. Ben was suspect of it. He knew something was off but nobody would believe him because he has such bad motives. So I thought that final reveal again, last season, the reveal was that Bentham was Locke's dead body in a coffin. This season it's Locke's dead body in a coffin. Very interesting for Lost to do that again. But that moment where we realize that the guy that we have spent most of this season with thinking it was John Locke is actually the man in black and us not knowing who that was, was an absolute oh my God, holy shit, what the hell moment. And that's not even the moment that ends the episode. That comes just before the very end. So that wasn't the, we're going to wait a year cliffhanger. They had something else up their sleeve. 
just a couple more things to say about the lock, not lock, uh, Ben and Jacob thing. Perhaps Jacob egged Ben on that way because he knew he was going to die. Perhaps Jacob selected one of our losties to be his champion. So maybe he knew that he couldn't beat this individual who is inhabiting the body of John Locke. So maybe he's still thinking two steps ahead of Ben and this individual who is in the body of John Locke vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the man in black. There's a scene where our losties come upon these people in the jungle. And these people in the jungle happen to be Bernard and Rose. They are very peaceful living in the jungle in this hut. I find it very interesting that that Rose just basically says, you people, all you guys want to do is shoot bullets at each other and destroy each other. And it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that we're together. But I think that this episode really drives home the the theme that was sort of given to us uh, uh, during the first episode of Lost when Locke showed Walt the two checker pieces from the Chinese checker game. He had one piece that was light and he had another piece that was that was black. And I really like the way that this episode sort of illustrates that life is a perfect circle. And no matter what you do, that circle is always going to close. A lot of it is cyclical and yeah, absolutely. What goes around comes around, but there is some sort of closure there. So it was awesome to see Rose and Bernard um, back. And as all of this is going on, you know, Jack is still convinced that if they detonate the bomb, they can change the course of everything. So, you know, our Sawyer and Juliet are on the sub. They got to get off the sub. They got to get to the island. And all of this is playing out. Sawyer and Jack get into a fist fight um, because they are, they always have this tension between them where they just can never get along. But the surprising moment comes when Juliet now agrees with Jack. So Sawyer is not on board with that, but Juliet says like, no, I agree with this guy. And it, it cuts James real deep in those moments, but then he kind of comes around and, and understands why she feels that way. But I thought that whole Jack Sawyer tension was a nice return to like a familiar dynamic we have seen throughout the seasons where these two guys as similar as they can be, have such differing viewpoints that like, they just can't really get along. It's like they're two alphas and they just can't be in the same cage together. So I thought that was good. And seeing Juliet kind of in the middle of this who, and her flip. Um, and when she, he says to her, like, how did you flip? Like, what was it? And she says, well, it's the way you looked at Kate. And he says, no, like, I don't, we are meant, you and me are meant to be together. You know, it, it's not Kate. That was not supposed to be my thing. And she says, look, I'm fine. Like, I, I love the, what we've had here. But I feel like if we can stop this whole thing from ever happening, you know, I won't ever have to lose you if we never meet. And all of this that I, I just love that the justification is heartbreaking, but yet acknowledging that they do have something. And it really sets us on this weird road where we're excited for them to try and stop this thing with the bomb. But partway through that, someone says, wait a minute. What if we don't stop the incident? What if we cause it? And that throws a wrench into everything that we've thought about this episode as they are rushing over to get this bomb from Jughead and take it to the swan. And we're like, oh, shoot. What if this is the thing that is the incident? What did you think, Marcelo, as all of this fighting with our losties and they're on this mission and then partway through somebody says, 
What if this isn't the cure? What if we are creating the disease? I adore this episode beyond belief. But the one thing that really bothered me as I was rewatching this episode is the fact that Juliet was all flip floppy. Jesus woman, make up your mind. Okay, first you say to James, oh, I just want to get on the boat. No, and then you're like, oh, no, we should get we should get off the boat so we can stop Jack from blowing up the island. You know, and then you're like, oh, no, we should actually join Jack in his effort to blow up the island. What do you want to do? Do you want to get off the island? Do you want to help Jack? Or what is it that you want to do? The justification that she gives really pissed me off because I'm like, Juliet, you are a grown woman. You have to be secure enough in the way that you feel about James that you have to understand that he's with you because he wants to be with you. He doesn't want to be with Kate. Feelings for Kate are always going to be there, but you have to understand that at the end of the day, he's not going to choose Freckles. He's going to choose you, Blondie. So that really infuriated the hell out of me. There's a really, really short, quick scene between Kate and Jack. To where Jack asked Kate, look, I know you told me never to ask you why about Aaron again. And Kate pauses and she doesn't really say anything. She just has this look. She came back for Jack. Jack admits to Sawyer that the reason why he came back to the island was not because of destiny. It wasn't because of that. It was because of Kate. Because he says, because he said, look, I lost her once and I don't want to do it again. And Sawyer says, look, if you love her so much, dude, she's right out there. Just go and tell her. Just get up, walk over there and go and tell her. But the fact that he doesn't do that drove me up a wall. The, the fact that he is too proud to do that just makes me love that little quirk of this episode even more. Come on. Matt, you had to know that, first of all, I'm the relationship guy in this podcast. So you had to know that I was going to gravitate towards that stuff once it came up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so definitely knew that uh, as a big Jack and Kate shipper, you would enjoy those scenes for sure. And it is frustrating if these people could just be honest with each other and sift through the bullshit. They could be happy. But unfortunately human nature is that a lot of times people's pride or fear of getting hurt gets in the way. But I did love that. Yeah. There's a lot with those different relationships that sort of comes to a head during this episode before stuff gets supercharged and crazy as it does in the finale of this, where the drill that is digging that they are trying to stop is unstoppable at a certain point. So they they get there and they tell Pierre Chang to stop the drill and he can't because the magnetism of the island is pulling the drill and that is why they can't do it. And Radzinski is there and everything is going crazy. And Jack <laughs> chucks the bomb down the hatch, hoping that this will erase everything that has happened will make make them turn up at LAX happy but as he drops it they wait they wait they wait nothing happens it doesn't go off the bomb is a dud and then everything starts going crazy because of this magnetism jack gets knocked out cuz he gets hit in the head by a toolbox that goes flying and as everything is happening and people are getting hurt and the whole site is like collapsing in on itself, Juliet somehow gets wrapped up in chains that are now pulling her into this whole mess. And there is a moment where Sawyer and Kate rush to try and save her in like a amazing Spider-Man moment. And Sawyer is holding on, but these magnetic chains are pulling Juliet down this pit and it's kind of an Indiana Jones in the last crusade moment as well where you know he's holding on and she says I can't hold on anymore and it's fine and Sawyer is like no no it's not like I'm not gonna let you go and she's like 
no, I like, I can't do this anymore. You got to let me go. And it's a really painful moment. And then Juliet lets go and falls down the shaft. Marcella, what are you thinking as Sawyer has this agonizing moment with Juliet? The scene of um, Kate and James trying to pull Juliet back up, but just the just the look on Juliet when she says, no, it's fine, really, really tore my heart out and put it on the floor and burned it. And I remember watching this episode for the first time with my grandmother, and my grandmother was a giant Juliet fan. So when we watched this episode way back when, when Juliet was basically being pulled down by, by the magnet, I was like, there's no fucking way that James is going to be able to pull her up. And, you know, when she fell down the hole, my grandmother couldn't take it. She just lost her mind. She just, she started tearing up. There's one particular moment that I just want to highlight. Before Jack throws the warhead down into the, down into the, into the pit, he looks at Kate and Kate just has this look of sorrow and pain on her face, but she just goes, she just gives him a nod. And the fact that Jack is so dependent on what Kate thinks of him. I just love that. I really, really love that. When I was watching this, the, the scene play out today, I was in tears. I, I mean, I mean, thank God I was in the house by myself because I was, I, I, I didn't have any tissues, but I was bawling. My eyes were turning red. It was just bad. And after a few seconds, when the bomb doesn't go off, you know, uh, Juliet wakes up and then she just she's you know writhing in pain and then she grabs a nearby rock. She starts hitting the nuclear uh, warhead with a with a rock and saying, "Come on, you bastard! Come on, you son of a!" And then it just cuts to white. And just like I did the first time I saw the episode way back when, I stood up and I applauded. And I'm like, "This is why Lost is one of the best fucking shows ever in American history." I do like it, and I do think that it, it was heartbreaking when Juliet fell down, and then, as always, if you don't see them die, then they are not dead, and so we do cut back to her down there, severely injured, and in those moments where she grabs that rock, and you can just feel her pain and her struggle, and knowing that if she can detonate this bomb, and that if they are successful, then one she probably won't be dead because they will have fixed whatever that would have brought her to the island in the first place. So we're rooting for this to happen at this point. We're kind of all in on making this bomb go off. And I do love that we see the pain and the frustration and the effort as she is making it happen. And then we hear the noise of a bomb going off as the whole episode slow fades to white. And then from that white, the words lost come in slowly. And it's like, oh my God, this is the end. We won't know if they are successful. And if this has corrected the timeline and changed everything until Lost comes back, you know, eight months from when this episode aired. And I remember thinking like, that is awesome. Very cool ending, emotional, painful, and exciting. And with everything that had gone on with the Ben Locke Jacob, watching Jacob get kicked into the fire in such a brutal manner, and then Juliet doing this last Hail Mary, giving it everything she got to hopefully fix things, was a spectacular ending to an episode that had a lot of forward momentum in terms of the stories, and really put us in a place where we had no idea what the show could be going forward and where we were going to go from this moment. So the possibilities seemingly are all up in the air and season six has big shoes to fill as it was known going into it, that that would be the last season of lost. This episode felt like a serious finale. Like I would have been okay if lost ended right here. Like, am I completely crazy or did you want answers to all the to all the lock or the not lock and the Ben stuff? You're not crazy because I honestly think, and especially rewatching it now, knowing part of what is to come, 
I thought, you know what? If they had just had a longer explanation before that Jacob man in black fake lock showdown as to who those two were and what that would mean for humanity. You explain that stuff, but then you have Juliet successfully detonate the bomb. You show the plane land at LAX. Everyone gets off. They don't know each other. None of what we have gone through has happened. Then you just show at LAX, the man in black and Jacob standing there. And Jacob looked over at the man in black and said, nice try, but it looks like they found a loophole. And man in black says like, you know, fuck you, I'll get you one day. Walks away. Jacob, you know, helps Jack with his bag as he goes out to his cab. End of series. Fucking chef's kiss. No problem. Great ending. I just love the way that the storytelling was all tied up in this season and how the st- how every little thing that they brought up got tied up nicely in a bow. That's what really distresses me about the season that we're going to talk about here in the weeks to come. Look, I love the show, but season six, I'm like, guys, you did season five so well. Why in the hell couldn't you do it again? If I had to sort of grade the season as a whole, I would give it probably an eight. Yeah, I think eight is probably a strong rating and about where I would put it. You know, it wasn't a full 10. There were a couple of down spots for me, but overall, very solid season with a lot of great character development, twists and turns, a lot of weird stuff went down. But overall, it felt like vintage lost and left the possibilities for the final season so up in the air and so endless that no matter what was to come up to this point, Lost was still one of the greatest shows I had ever watched. Um, I just want to say thank you to our audience who, uh, who have been listening to us since day one. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we passed 43 views on one of our episodes in one day and that's the first time that we've ever done that so i would just like to thank you to our audience who has been with us since day one and thank you for supporting us it means so much to me and matt thank you thank you so much yeah definitely anybody who's listening and hearing this we appreciate you and we definitely are glad you've been along for the ride with us next week we do start the final season of Lost. We will re- be reviewing the season premiere LAX, which is another one of those episodes that aired as an as a 2-hour premiere. It's on streaming as LAX part 1 and part 2. So if you are watching along with our rewatch, that's the homework for next week. If you have any questions or comments, you can tweet using the hashtag radio815 or direct at us at, us at jjuniverse815. If you have any direct questions for me, I am on Twitter at Matt Crandall. Marcelo, you're also on Twitter. How can the people reach you? You can just reach me. I'm at CreekFanatic88. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what we do here, like, follow, subscribe, tell your friends. And until next time, Radio 815 over and out.